Man, mom. That means men, teenagers, unmarried people, male, female, doesn't matter. As long as they're not a mom, that's just a reminder for next Sunday. If you can uh, bring something, let's make it real special for moms. Today, uh, we have a few to be baptized this morning. That's a blessing. And, uh, but we want to bring the message, first of all, from the Word of the Lord. If you'll turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 17. Now, we have the clipboard going through here. And uh, then maybe... Uh, when it gets back around uh, Brother John, maybe you can bring it up here, Brother Bodick, and then they can pass it through here. <laughs> now, don't let that thing bother you while we're preaching. Just uh, if you could sign up, though, that'd be great to bring some stuff. We'll have a great time in two weeks. By the way, this Tuesday, this Tuesday, May 7th, is the 30th anniversary of our church moving into this building. We had our very first service ever. That, that, it fell on a Sunday. May 7th, 1989 was our first service we ever had in this building. And the 30 years that we've been in this building have been a blessing in many ways. We had Brother Bud Bennett with us, the singing truck driver. Any of you remember Bud Bennett? He was from the big city of Tidiute, Pennsylvania. And uh, he, uh, he, he sang a bunch. Boy, he was a good singer, too. He was a blessing. He's with the Lord now. And that was our first Sunday we ever had. It was 30 years ago exactly this Tuesday. And I've taped some pictures up to a wall over here on the front uh, where you can see us, all the pictures of the development when we added that addition on in 2002. We knocked out this wall and put an addition on in 1996. And then in 2002, we knocked out that wall and dug the basement and added that addition on in 2002. And there's a bunch of the pictures there you can look at later. And we thank the Lord. We should thank the Lord for uh, the place he's given to us to assemble as a congregation of brothers and sisters in the Lord, have fellowship. And I really appreciate all the care that so many of you have put into the building over the years and uh, made it look good and... Uh, Thank you very much. That's, uh, those aren't main things, but they are a blessing. Luke chapter 17 is one of the seven major prophecies of the Old Testament, or the New Testament. There's prophecy without, throughout the scriptures, and there's prophecy throughout the New Testament, but there's seven major portions of scripture that deal with prophecy in the New Testament, the biggest one being the last book, the book of Revelation, the whole thing is about prophecy. Prophecy is the fourth telling of the future by God. He tells us exactly what's going to happen a long time before it happens. And here in Luke is one of these major prophecies, Luke 17, Luke 21 is another one, Matthew 24 is another one, and 2 Timothy chapter 3 is another one, but there's these major, major prophecies, and Luke 17 is one of them. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ telling us what it's going to be like before his second coming. A lot of the prophecies of the Old Testament told us about Christ's first coming. We call that Christmas. But he's coming again, first of all, to the clouds where we'll meet him in the air that's called the rapture. And then he'll come back seven years later to the earth, and he will set up his kingdom on earth, a kingdom of righteousness and peace, a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And we look forward to that. It's almost hard to believe uh, that that's going to happen on this planet, but it's going to. Everything else God has said has come to pass. Why not believe that too? Amen? Amen. Today I want to speak to you on the subject of the one woman everyone should remember in the last days. The one woman everyone should remember in the last days. As I mentioned to you about the book of Luke recently, we've kind of been looking at a lot of things in Luke lately. Luke is the longest book of the New, oh, the New Testament. It's a great book for women. There's more stories about women in the book of Luke than any other book in the Bible. 
I want to encourage you all, men and ladies, to study the book of Luke, but we've been through this. And 60% uh, of the book of Luke is unique. Uh, you don't find it anywhere else in the Gospels, and it's just unique. We have a prophecy here about the last days. Uh, prophecies are amazing about how the Lord talks about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and pestilences in many places. And he talks about perilous times coming and men shall be lovers of their own selves and boasters and proud and covetousness uh, will abound. And, and uh, boy, all the prophecies about Israel and the Jews that have been dispersed in all the nations of the earth for over 2,000 years would start piling back into their land. And what do we see today in 2019? We see over 7 million Jews back in their own land. That's half of them. God is setting up something. He's setting up something called the tribulation. The time of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble. When all Israel shall be saved. And there are people leaving nations by the hordes going into Israel, Jews, they can't build housing fast enough for them. It's happening right in front of our eyes and there's no explanation for it. That's the most dangerous place on earth. Who would, who would take their family back there for any reason? But they are. Why? God said so. And everything God said is going to happen is going to happen. And that's right in front of our eyes. Keep your eyes on Israel. The last days are here. These are the last of the last days. Now, I don't know if that means 10 more years, 20 more years, 40. I don't know what that means. But these are the last of the last days. And in all the amazing prophecies, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's only one woman that Jesus tells us that everyone should remember in the last days. Now, you'd think it might be a woman like Sarah or uh, Rebecca, or Rachel, or Elizabeth, or Esther, or Ruth, or Abigail, or Deborah, all those wonderful women, Phoebe, Priscilla. And how about Mary? Wonderful Mary, the virgin, uh, that brought our Lord into this world. And Ruth, and just many, many, many wonderful ladies that we have in the scriptures to study. But Jesus said, for you that are alive in 2019, in the last of the last days, he said, there's one woman I want every one of you to remember. Let's start reading in verse 22. The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. And they shall say to you, see here or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. In other words, it's, it's, you're going to know what happened. You know, some of the cults say, well, Christ returns spiritually and, and it's all a mystery. No, no. When it lightnings out, you all know what happened. All right? Nobody says, what was that? Everybody says, that was lightning. That was thunder. And when the Son of Man comes, you're going to know what happened. As the lightning, verse 24. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Of course, we know that story. The crucifixion of Christ. But then he begins and he shows us the two last signs before his return. One is the days of Noah. The other is the days of Lot. Those are the last two signs. And then comes the rapture, as we'll see in a moment. And the Lord says, when you see the world like it was in the days of Noah, and you see the world as it was in the days of Lot, then you can expect the rapture to come anytime soon. 
He says, as it was in the days of Noah, verse 26, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now that's a picture of the rapture. The safety of God's people taken out of the destruction of the world by water. And boy, things were just going like normal. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Sounds like today. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot. Now what were those days like? Now Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah for over 20 years. What was Sodom and Gomorrah like? They did eat. Verse 28, they drank. They bought. They sold, they planted, they builded. Sound like today? But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Again, a type of the rapture. The Lord delivered the righteous before the destruction came. Do you realize in the first two years of the tribulation period after the rapture, one-third of the inhabitants of the earth will be killed? 7.2 billion people on earth, that's a lot of funerals in a couple years. But God taking out his people before the flood, taking out his people before the fire, is a picture of the rapture. Verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. It's pretty clear. Jesus says when you go back into the Old Testament, you study what it was like in Noah's day. And we're not going to do that this morning. He said, that's what it's going to be like. It says the imagination of men's hearts was only evil continually. And God said it repented me that I made man. I'm sorry I ever created man. That's what it was like in the days of Noah. In the days of Lot, you study what it was like. Genesis 13 through 19 gives us the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam and Zoar and those cities of the plain. Jesus made it clear. He says, when the world repeats that, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop. Now, I believe this is a, a, a Jewish prophecy to those still here in the tribulation. He which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. And now notice the next three words. Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Right before the rapture and before the time of the tribulation, there is one woman who lived in the past on this planet, that Jesus brings up in prophecy, and only one. He says, of all the women that have ever lived, in 2019, May 5th, the Lord says to his people, his church, I want you to remember one woman. Remember Lot's wife. What do you know about Lot's wife? Not much, but there's a lot written about her. It's written about her because she had a husband named Lot, and before they appear in history, the Lord said the two shall be one flesh. Now, you know a man, you just about know everything that his wife goes through. When it tells us, for instance, that Lot had two daughters, what does that say about his wife? She was a mother. 
She had a couple girls. We learned something about Lot's wife. And I want to show you some things in history. If you'll turn back now with me to, oh, wait, wait, before we leave here, let's look at the rapture now. Why would it say this right after, remember Lot's wife, verse 33, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, and the one shall be taken, and the other left. This is the rapture. This is the song we just sang, changed in the twinkling of an eye. You don't have time to change your mind or your life in the twinkling of an eye. You don't have time to duck. Twinkling of an eye is pretty fast. Now the time to do that is long before this ever happens. To give our lives to the Lord, not lose our lives. See, you can't lose your soul, but you sure can lose your life. I believe Lot's wife was saved. Her soul. But her life was snuffed out like that. Her husband was a just man. The Bible says he was a righteous man who had a just, a just man who had a righteous soul. That's what it says about him in 2 Peter chapter 2. And uh, in verses 6 through 9. Now I want you to notice four things about Lot's wife today. As we study the Old Testament beginning at Genesis chapter 11 and verse number 27, Lot's wife had an extremely famous uncle-in-law and an extremely famous aunt-in-law that they lived with. Now, his name was Abraham. Her name was Sarah. Abraham had two brothers. One of his brothers was named, in verse 27, Nahor, and the other was Haran, and Haran begat Lot. So then Lot now would be Abraham's nephew. It tells us that Haran died, verse 28, and as a result, Abram took Lot in almost like his own son. But as you read the history here, and you kind of look between the lines and everything, you find Abram is 75 years old here. His wife is 65 years old. His brothers were old. His bro one brother died. And so Lot might be in his 30s, 40s, 20s, somewhere around there. We're going to find out, if you look close, he's already married, already has kids. They were just very close as families in those days. And I want you to notice the first thing about Lot's wife is that she lived in privilege, especially spiritual privilege. Her uncle, if I can call that uncle-in-law, Abraham, and Sarah were probably the most spiritual people alive on the earth in that day. But just because you grow up in the presence of spiritual people does not make you spiritual. And those of you that are young people, just because you grow up in a home where your mom and dad are spiritual and love the Lord, love the Bible, love to pray and love the church and love to win souls, it doesn't mean you're going to be that way. You can't make it on coattails Christianity. You've got to have your own faith. And when you get into your 20s and 30s and so on, we're going to find out what you really are. That happens. She grew up in privilege. Do you ever see what the Bible says about Abraham? You know, there's three times in the Bible it says these words that Abraham was the friend of God. 
In fact, God himself one time said, Abraham, my friend. That may be the greatest compliment anyone has ever received, except maybe John, whom Jesus loved. My friend. He was called a friend. He was called faithful. Over and over in the scriptures, he's called faithful Abraham. Faithful Abraham. His faith staggers me. He's not even, he's 75 years old and God says, look up. And look at the stars of the heavens, so I'm going to multiply your seed. And he's 75. He hasn't even had his first child yet. His wife's 65. And it wouldn't be till 25 years later, but it says he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. Wow, I don't know. If I was 100 and my wife was 90, I would start to doubt a little bit whether I was ever going to have my own child. What a man of faith. What a man of fear. He feared the Lord. When he finally did have his son Isaac, the Lord says to him, he tried him and said, I want you to take the, the wood and the fire and the knife and everything, go up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice your son, your only son Isaac to me. So what do you do? Three days journey. Off he went. Okay, God. You said this is the son of promise. You said that through him will be the promised seed and all the nations of the earth will be blessed and the Messiah will come, but now you tell me to, to sacrifice him? Okay. In Hebrews 11, he's recorded in the great hall of faith. He, 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 he came to the place where his faith said, well, I guess God is going to have to raise him from the dead after I sacrifice. What a, what a man of fear. He feared the Lord. In fact, God complimented him in Genesis 18. He said, I know Abraham. I know he's going to love me. I know he's going to fear me. I know he's going to put me before his family. How many people do that? Not many. He's going to put me before his family. And he became a father of many nations. God gave him the Abrahamic covenant one time and said, you're going to be a father of many nations. And boy, I'll say. Every Arab on earth claims him as his father, Abraham. Every Jew on earth claims him as his father. Every Christian, according to the book of Galatians, claims Abraham as our father. The one who came through the, mess the messianic line came through and we were saved. She was brought up in the presence and lived in the presence of probably the two most spiritual people on earth. Even Sarah is listed in Hebrews 11, verses 11 through 12, as having just mind-blowing faith. She said, I know my womb is dead. I know I can't have children, but the Lord said I'm going to, and she trusted the Lord. What about Abraham's prayer life? Have you ever studied the prayer life of Abraham? And Lot's wife grows up in the presence of this spiritual privilege for years, for decades, if you count the years. It says in chapter 12 and verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and notice this, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. Now Isaac, he's not born till chapter 21. So who are these souls? This is Lot. This is Lot's wife. This is Lot's children. These are the servants that they have accumulated because their business became so prosperous. All the souls. And they left the land of Canaan. I want you to notice, number two, she was a woman of possessions. She was a woman of possessions. In Genesis 13, in verse 5, it says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And what does it say about Abram in verse 1? And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him out of the south, into the south, and Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Lot's wife was a wife of privilege. She was a wife of possessions. 
And then I want you to notice she becomes a wife of prestige. Now we're going to have to explain some things here. Great spiritual men and women in the Bible make mistakes. I wish people knew that. I wish people knew that about pastors and leaders in the Lord's work. They make mistakes. Back in Genesis chapter number 12, they left Haran and they went into Canaan. And they weren't very long there. And I'm just going to kind of shorten this up so for time's sake. They weren't very long there and there came a famine. And Abraham fled in a famine, and he took his wife Sarah with him, and Lot and his wife, and, and they all went down into Egypt. They went down into Egypt, big mistake. Had some real hard times down there, too. They loved Egypt. Egypt was the zenith of the world at the time, the glamour of the world. It was amazing. Now it's the basest of kingdoms. You know why? God said it would be the basest of kingdoms someday. Whatever God says happens. Amen. They took Lot down there, and then they came out in chapter 13 and verse 1, and Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife. But as, I've, as we've seen before, they, you can take your children and those that are, you're responsible for and introduce them to Egypt, and you can take them back out of Egypt, but you can't get Egypt out of them. You've got to be careful about your children and your grandchildren about introducing them to the things of this world. Egypt is a type of the world. It's a type of being worldly. And you could say, boy, I want my kids to experience everything all the kids of the world are experiencing. I don't want my kids to miss out on anything. Big mistake. You teach your children about the things of this world, maybe you'll separate from the world and be a godly Christian someday, but they're going to struggle with those things. Well, they're back in the land of Canaan, and they become so rich, these two men, Abram and his nephew Lot, that their herdsmen begin to have strife. They begin to fight with each other, and Abraham finally says, look, it's obvious it's time for us to go our separate ways. You and all of your riches and your flocks and your herds, your cattle, and me, and, 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 and he gives Lot, his nephew, the choice. If you want to go this way, you go this way, I'll go that way. If you want to go this way, I'll go that way. Your choice. And what does Lot choose? He chooses the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboam, because the Bible says they were like two things. They were like the garden of the Lord. They were like the garden of Eden. It was like paradise. Number one. And then it says in verse 10 of chapter 13, like the land of Egypt. Like the land of Egypt. And Lot probably turned to Mrs. Lot and said, you know how much we loved Egypt when we were down there? How great that was. Remember how wonderful that was? Well, we can't go anywhere. We can't go there uh, anymore. We're out of there. But this place is just like it. Just like the world. This is like the Garden of Eden. This is like Egypt. And it says, first of all, he pitched his tent towards Sodom, which means that the opening of his tent, the flaps, the one door on his tent, every time he and his wife opened it up, Sodom and Gomorrah was spread out before. Look at that. Beautiful. Like the well-watered gardens of Eden in Egypt. Brethren, today you can't find a blade of grass growing there. Number two, in chapter 14, in verse 12, we find out that he ends up dwelling there. First he pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now verse 12. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son. Now this is a war, and we're not going to talk about the war and the kidnappings and stuff. But notice this phrase in verse 12. Who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. 
So now he pitched his tent towards Sodom, first of all. Second of all, now he's dwelling in Sodom. And then when you come to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, in chapter 19, in verse 1, we read this about Lot. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. Now, these are the two angels coming with the bad news that God has had it with Sodom. He's going to destroy them because of the way they were living. But notice a little phrase in verse number one. It says this, And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Do you know what that phrase means in Bible times? That means he was high up in politics. He was high up in government. He first pitched his tent toward Sodom. Then he dwelt there. And now this happens about 20 years later. Now he's sitting in the gate. That means as the men went out of the gate to work every day and came back in the gate at night uh, after their work and they closed the gates and everything, he was one of the government officials that would be there that would discuss small matters and large matters and so on and so forth. He now had prestige. And Lot's wife was a wife of prestige. Her husband was well known in the gates. And then notice, last of all, her posterity. She had two daughters. She had two daughters. And they lived in Sodom, and they were both married. They are both married girls. It talks about how as the angels came and warned Lot about what was going to happen to them. You see, remember what Jesus said about Sodom? Lot's day, they builded, they planted, they had their gardens, and they put up big barns, and they went to Lowe's, and they went to uh, Home Depot, and they got the latest and the nicest vanities and the nicest bathtubs and everything, and they always updating and updating and updating and updating, and it was great. And then one sunny morning, that's what it says, one sunny morning in Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone destroyed them all. See, everything was fine. As they, as they looked out at their country, they were having, or their land, their city, they were in prosperity. People were building, people were planning, people were eating and drinking and having a good time. Life was great in Sodom. Except their morals. Because when we are introduced to Sodom, it says this in Genesis 13, 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now I'm the last person in this room that ever wants to say this. But America is not so great today. Oh, the economy's booming. The unemployment rate's as low as ever. People are building, planting, eating, drinking, getting married. It's a sunny day in Sodom. But boy, the things that are going on in this country immorally. The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And Lot and his wife did a better job raising their cows than they did their kids. And they exposed their kids to this land. And they chose to live there. And Peter would say in 2 Peter chapter 2 that in seeing and in hearing the ungodly deeds of the wicked, they vex their righteous souls. What's that mean? They became worldly. Remember Lot's wife. They became worldly. 
John, the beloved disciple, said to us, Love not the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's of the world, it's not of the Father. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But whoso doeth the will of God abideth forever. What about her posterity? She wasn't there to raise them. Children are a legacy. She wasn't there to raise them. Now, why wasn't she there to raise them? When these angels came, Lot went into the town of Sodom and he warned his sons-in-law that God was going to destroy this place. But he seemed to them as one that mocked. He was so powerless in his words, that he had no influence on his family anymore. And his sons-in-laws thought he was a comedian. Ah, did you hear what Dad just said? God's going to destroy this place. <laughs> they laughed. So the two angels go in and it says, and while they lingered, Lot was lingering. He was just hanging around. Lot's wife was lingering, just hanging around. And it says the two angels went in, and one grabbed Lot by the hand, and one grabbed Lot's wife by the hand, and literally started dragging them out of Sodom. The other angel grabbed their one daughter by the hand, and their other daughter by the hand, and began to drag them out of Sodom. And in doing so, gave the family one commandment. Do not look back. That's all. Just don't look back. I got a feeling when the rapture takes place, some of us are going to be looking back. Saying, man, I don't want to leave there. I love that place. I hope not. I think people are going to be dragged, kicking and screaming to heaven in the rapture, some people. The angels had to grab their hands and drag them out. Come on. But it says while leaving, Lot's wife turned back. And she looked longingly at her city. Because she loved it so much. Now keep in mind, her husband was a just man with a, right, a righteous soul. And I believe she was saved, but her act of looking back showed three things. First of all, it revealed her disobedience. Second of all, it revealed her unbelief. I don't think that's really going to happen. And third of all, it revealed her bondage to the things of this world. And she died instantly and was turned into a pillar of salt. And of all the precious ladies in the Bible, Jesus says in the end, remember Lot's wife. When it gets close, remember Lot's wife. Her posterity, in closing, she's not there to help her girls. She's dead. She's not there to help her husband. You know, they could have find, found a couple more boys. Their, their sons-in-laws, they got tried like crispy chicken in the fire. Real joke, wasn't it? So they come out now, these little widows. They could have found two more guys and preserved a godly seed. Married them. Preserved a godly seed. But Lot's wife's not there to help. Her husband or her daughter's. And you talk about what 
believers are capable of doing when they're influenced by the world, it's shocking. It's shocking the behavior some people in our church have gotten involved in after their salvation. And she is dead, and the girls come out, and they're living in a cave. That's all they have left. And they say, you know, nobody, we don't have anybody to, to, for our father's name to live on. Let's get dad drunk. And you sleep with him tonight, and I'll sleep with him tomorrow. And it, It's unbelievable. Where would, where would two girls ever come up with an idea like this? Except they've been living in Sodom. They've been watching TV. They've been watching internet sites. I don't know where they got these ideas. But they become both pregnant by their father. And what is the posterity of Lot's wife? Her children, who could have been wonderful, end up fathering the Moabites and the Ammonites, which is about the worst legacy a mother could ever leave. Enemies of Israel until their extinction. What a horrible legacy. Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Now I want to close just by saying this. America is a place of privilege. She grew up under Abraham and Sarah. We've grown up under D.L. Moody. And, I, mean, I mean, we have so much privilege today that there has never been a time. You can go to YouTube and watch B.R. Lakin, Lester Roloff, Lee Roberson, David Gibbs, Tom Malone, Jack Hiles, Curtis Hudson, all week long if you wanted to. We've got an English Bible. We've got concordances and dictionaries. And we've got the greatest teachers that the world has ever known spiritually. We have grown up in privilege. We've grown up with possessions. They said back in 2011 that if you earn $20,000 a year in 2011, the whole package, that means your health benefits, everything. 401k, whatever, if, if, if the whole package was $20,000 in 2011, you were in the top one half of 1% when it comes to the richest people on the planet. 99.5% of the planet was poorer than you. 50% of the people on this earth never dream once. Never once does the dream come into their mind that they might own a bicycle. 91% of the people on this planet never does it come into their mind that they might have a chance someday of owning one car. We live in possessions. We live in prestige. America. Evangelical Christians just got a president elected who is our friend. Like him or not, he's, the, he's a friend of Christians. We live in prestige. We sit in the gates. But what about our posterity? Our children, our grandchildren. And I think that's why the Lord said, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Some of you are starting to earn a lot of money. Some of you young people grew up in this church are starting to work. You have independence now. You got money like you never knew existed now. You got freedom now. You got cars now. There is a trap set for you. Some of you are waning. Some of you are wandering away. Some of you used to be so on fire for God when you were teenagers.
But now the world's distracting you. You're getting involved in activities that aren't bad, but they're not eternal. It's taking up all your time, your money. What about your calling? What about the claim God had on your life and your youth? Remember Lot's wife. Because Jesus said right after that, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Let us pray. Father, we ask you to help us now. We thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray in the name of Jesus for so many of our youth and so many have just dropped out completely and we don't even see them anymore. Or they've stopped Sunday school, they've quit coming Wednesdays, and I know some people, their schedules, can't, they can't make things. I understand that, Lord, but some were so on fire, some were soul winners, passing out tracks by the bazillions, concern for the will of God in their life. But like Lot's wife, the prestige, the possessions, the privilege. It all meant nothing to her in the end. Because she loved the world and the things of this world. And Jesus, you're our Lord, our Master, our Savior. We, we should love you. You died for us. You saved us from hell, from sin. And in all the prophecies, you just told us to remember one woman. Remember Lot's wife. And some are not doing that. God, bring them back, we pray, whatever it takes. Bring them back. So our heads are bowed and 228. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. The 223, I'm sorry. It takes time to be holy. It doesn't just happen. That's what the song here says. Take time to be holy. It doesn't just happen. There's not a human being on earth who's holy. First of all, we need to be saved. And then we need to be sanctified by a progressive work of the Holy Ghost in us through spending time in the Bible and prayer and church and letting God clean us up and change us. As this great hymn of the faith, Take Time to Be Holy, is being played, I want to encourage you maybe to stand to your feet, step out to the aisle, come and pray, say, God, help me. Help me to remember Lot's wife. All the advantages she had. Look how she ended up. Look how her husband ended up. Look how her children ended up. Won't you come? Some have come to pray. How about you? If you need to be saved. When I began the sermon, I read where one will be taken, the other will be left. Three times Jesus said that. Will you be left behind? Will you be left behind? to go through the tribulation period on earth such as the world has never seen? Or will you be saved and taken out in the twinkling of an eye at the rapture? If you need to be saved, it's not hard. Somebody can show you just a couple verses from the Bible, pray with you, give you the opportunity to ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Savior. You just need to go to the back. Somebody will be waiting to meet you. While the music plays, feel free to stand and go to the back and say, I just, I want to know what this being saved thing is. Is there anyone else that would come and say, you know, the world's starting to get me. 
I used to be on fire for the Lord. But now it's not bad things at all. I'm not involved in bad things, but Pastor Cole, it's good things that are eating up my affections, my emotion, my energy, my time, my money. Not eternal things. Anyone else need to come? This time we're going to have Pastor Seth come and sing with you these verses. Let's stand to our feet. Find the Psalm Book 223. Take time to be holy.